Good afternoon. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to an exchange for media conversation, an exchange for media dialogue on marketing technology, on technology, on what's happening in the business environment. This is live on exchangeformedia.com, impactonnet.com, pitchonnet.com. It is also live on bwcio.com. Um, today we have a very special guest uh, and we couldn't have had a special person, more special person than him, a more relevant person than him to talk to us about how technology is in some way transforming our businesses and will help us triumph in the future. So with this, let me welcome Mr. Karan Bajwa, who's the MD and CEO of Google Cloud in India. Welcome Mr. Bajwa to this conversation and we're delighted you could join us. I'm assuming that you're joining us from your home in Gurgaon. Uh, how has remote working changed uh, uh, the way we do business and uh, bring technology to the fore. I'm sure uh, that's the silver lining that uh, all cloud companies, and especially Google Cloud, which is such a large player in this segment, have seen. So how have been the last 90 days for you, Mr. Bajwa? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anurag. It's always a pleasure to interact with you. And I've, I've seen you and your platform grow, so it's always a pride when I, when I look at you. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, look, I think you know it's um, it's not an easy time for anyone. Uh, so while I while I will talk about the silver lining in this whole environment, I want to be respectful that everyone's situation is different, and uh, people are going through very very tough times. Just before this, you and I were talking about the fact that as this gets closer to us, reality bites, and uh, it's getting personal as as some of our friends, family get impacted. Uh, so it's a very tough time, which is uh, unprecedented. Anurag, you and I have lived many crises in our lifetime, which have been uh, not as deep and as prolonged and as impactful as this one. Um, it's been three plus months and we still have, aren't seeing any way the close to the end of it. The financial impact is very, very deep. We have not yet calculated the lasting financial impact of this. Um, you know, people's work styles, work lives have changed. All of that is, uh, is and you know, not everyone is engineered to be working remotely. People's environments are different. So I'm respectful of all of those limitations in people's minds, people's environments. And yet I see that there is a lot of things that are going positive. Uh, first of all, Anurag, we are able to spend time with families that we never did. Think about it. You know, uh, how much time would we spend with our families? Uh, and suddenly now we have time at hand with families. It does bring in very awkward moments, but it's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, just surely in terms of um, our ability to work from home, first organizations went through the learning curve. Anurag and I can tell you that not many organizations were engineered for 100% work from home for a prolonged time. You'd be surprised at the kind of organizations that were challenged, deeply technical organizations, organizations that were actually the, the providers of technology also got challenged. So people went through that learning curve of making sure they could as much as possible. And I'm sure not every organization can. Manufacturing is a, is a tough challenge. As many organizations as possible working from home. Working from home also, you know, um, there are some interesting nuances on it. Suddenly we find time on our hands. You know, I'm personally seeing Anurag that productivity is an all time high. You know, we have a wonderful tool at Google where we actually can track our, uh, uh, we can track, you know, just the productivity that we have on a weekly basis. It's mind boggling. It's, it's not a number I'd like to quote because it's not a benchmark I'd like to set. That's not the right way of working, but simply you have time at hand. Your ability to engage with customers is very, very easy. Think about a forum like this in Iraq. If we had to do this forum in person, imagine the number of people you would have to invite, the logistics that you would have to do. People would have to travel from their homes to the location and back. You would take about four to five hours to do a one hour intervention. And here we are, walking in from a prior meeting and we'll walk into a next meeting simply taking one hour and we can we can impact i was just counting and i understand there is a, there is huge webinar fatigue uh, that is setting in but yet people's ability to learn people's appetite to learn has significantly gone up technology has played a ma massive low, role in this whole whole um, you know change that we are seeing and uh, god bless the telecom companies and rag you know they were going through a very very tough time pre covid and suddenly we see that they are the kind of foundation on which we are all able to work today. So, so bless them. And I hope that that uh, sector emerges much stronger. But uh, technology has played a massive role in helping us 
you know, get through the be productive today. Be productive today, absolutely. So, uh, and there are many learnings we'll talk about as we go on rags. There are many learnings about uh, then, the uh, hows of working. Yeah, please. You have almost had a three decade career in this, right? and you worked with large technology companies. Um, you are now leading Google Cloud in India. Before that, you were with IBM. Before that, you were in Microsoft. Uh, so you've seen technology for at least past 25 years uh, very closely, you know, and how it impacts human interactions, how it impacts work, how it impacts business. So tell us what has changed uh, in the last 25 years. Give us two, three mega trends and also tell us where in the next three to five years, uh, where we are headed. Sure. Look, you know, uh, let me give you the lens of, um, you know, how I've seen technology, the mindset around technology change over the years at Arag. I remember 20 years ago when we would send an email to a CEO uh, as a technology company reaching out to the CEO, we would immediately be sent off to the IT department. The CEO would never engage, rarely engage. That was the first kind of, I, I saw that wave. And I'll, I'll bring it alive from a technology standpoint, but I want to talk about the relevance of technology to businesses. Sure. Then came a point where CEOs got interested in technology. They wanted to know more. And we used to have conversations with CEOs, but they always used to be, they, it used to be along with the IT, IT departments. The CEO could never have the conversation alone. So we would always have the CEO and the IT uh, department together. Then came the phase when, um, you know, when CEOs got interested, they, they got deeper, they started seeing the business impact and they wanted to learn more and they wanted sort of to, to reach out and, and engage directly with the companies. We started seeing a very different engagement at CEOs and board levels. And finally came the phase of um, really, uh, you know, deploying <coughs> uh, capabilities like the CDO, the CTO across organizations. So we've seen a multitude of phases of technology adoption, the relevance, what will happen after COVID? I'll talk about it in a, in a minute, but but I've seen the relevance of uh, technology change at the CEO's desk in, in a significant way. Technology 20 years ago was absorbed or adopted in a very fragmented manner. Uh, the traditional buying of hardware and then software and integration and then support, it was bought in a very fragmented way. Integration started happening. You saw outsourcing happen, which was basically you know, uh, letting go of, uh, you know, what you could not do very well. We saw that phase happen. We saw a phase where people were uh, consolidating technology assets. Then we saw a phase where people were very comfortable buying fragmented technology, integrating that. They became comfortable with technology. So we've seen many phases of technology adoption in that sense. And now we were just about getting into a phase where the consumption model of technology was coming in and around. And that kind of was being fostered by cloud uh, hyperscalers as well as by SaaS companies. So the consumption model uh, came into being. I believe that this particular phase that we are going through, however unfortunate, does provide a massive tailwind to uh, to the whole ecosystem around cloud and SaaS companies. <coughs> the consumption of technology will fundamentally change as we emerge from this crisis. God bless, we should do uh -huh. soon. But uh, yes. it'll fundamentally change as well. So, uh, Varun, sorry, quickly coming to the uh, today's agenda. Now. So, the one thing that we wanted to start with, and then there are a couple of points that I, uh, I think uh, Iraq, there is uh, cross the there 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 some cross there. connection. Priyanka and uh, before that, you were in the I'll happened, just check. I'll just check. I'll just check. I guess you have two studios live right now, Anurag. Yeah, it must be. It must be. You know, I can't tell you, you know, just to build on, you know, I am very aware. I told you what happened to two of my colleagues yesterday. Uh, one of my senior most colleagues in the Bombay office went to heaven and one of my... So we, I'm aware of the personal challenges, both on the life side and the livelihood side. Right? And uh, one, what one can do is to do your best, pray for others, and do whatever you can do within power, to, your power and means to help them. And contribute your, you know, I'm, you know, people like you and me cannot sit idle because we also have responsibility for other people. I have responsibility for 300 people beyond my own team uh, at home, right? So I think we sure. have to go on. But one of the things that has happened is I'll give you both exchange for media and business world as example. Business world has kept saying that we have to be video first, digital first. Today we are doing four to six hours of programming in business world. We're doing two to four hours of programming, video programming in uh, exchange for media. We've become fully digital. We've added 30,000 subscribers to the business world newsletter organically. Organically, we've hit 30 million traffic in businessworld.in. 
for the last four months on an average. We used to do between 12 to 18 million. And so, you know, there are positives that have come through without kind of making too much effort. And what we have to look at is the impact on the environment. We're traveling less. Uh, so, you know, it helps our body, mind. You're eating at home. When did you eat for 60 days at home currently? I, I didn't. So I think there are positive. Of course, what is negative is people are losing their lives. Uh, businesses are under pressure. Uh, and there is a definite, if I may use, and I'll send you an article I read, uh, that people are grieving. Uh, there is a grief said, unsaid, about you know a lot of things changing around them. Not being able to go and see somebody you want to see, right? Not being able to go for a walk. So coming back to technology, technology will ensure some of those experiences are in some way mapped online. Uh, you were talking to me, and then the interruption came. So we come. You were giving us a perspective on um, you know sure, how sure. every you know how CEOs, promoters now talk to the technology company and the technology evangelist, and they want to talk first to the technology person. And I keep saying every business. You know earlier we would say this is a food tech business, this is a media tech business, this is a med tech business. No, every business has to be a tech business. It has to be a fintech. It has to be a prop tech. I mean, if it's not tech, it won't possibly thrive. Sure. I think and that brings to the point that um, we'd almost reconcile to the fact that all businesses are enabled by technology. But I think what's going to happen in this environment post-COVID is that technology will become the driving force. It will bring technology to the fore of the business and not just the enabler for the business. But I was going to talk about, um, uh, about just the trends that we see uh, on technology post-COVID. What are going to be the big trends um, that uh, that are going to be dominant in the marketplace as as we emerge stronger uh, out of this crisis. So first of all, I think there is an opportunity. Even before I talk about technology, there's an opportunity for us to reinvent the way we work. Our workplace should look different from the time that uh, you know we came out came into this crisis. The workplace should look very very different. Uh, ability to work from home has opened up people's eyes into the art of the possible in terms of what can be done. Uh, there are some very bold uh, moves that have been announced by the organizations. One of the IT companies actually has publicly announced that uh, by the year 2025, they would only have about 25% of their workforce sitting in a physical office. Now, Anurag, that is bold, right? That changes fundamentally how, what the workplace will look like. And bless everyone, if, if you embrace that mindset as much to the extent you can, uh, depending on the business that you run, that would completely change many dynamics in the marketplace. The cost dynamics for technology companies, uh, the dynamics for the real estate business, et cetera, et cetera. It will change a lot of things. So the first trend that I would see is people, organizations will build a capability of working from home. And it's not just about video, uh, Anurag. Video was the first point of uh, port of call as, as we got into this crisis. Uh, video was just the first port of call. There is there is collaboration, there is security that comes in, there is seamless exchange of data sharing. How do you actually have a meeting uh, as if you and I are sitting in the same room? So organizations will implement uh, ways and means to implement work from home for 100% of their... Uh, I pray we never have to face anything like this, but that's the first thing I see. Increase in digitization and RAG will, will automatically increase the demand for, the, as the footprint of digitization increases, the surface area increases, demand for security and privacy will go up. Um, security will serve as the foundation element for innovation in things like uh, AI on big data, on cloud, et cetera. So that's the second piece that I see, uh, increase of security. The third fundamental uh, change I see is the consumption model of technology should change, will change, from a very op a capex driven model to an opex driven model and i i know i have a colored lens on the cloud but uh, you know I'm, I'm more talking about consumption models uh, rather than I'm, I'm not trying to talk only about the cloud but the consumption model people will conserve capital and and use it for their core business whereas they will adopt technology more boldly through uh, opex and opex allows you to lower the entry barrier for uh, for use of technology uh, the third thing, the fourth thing I see is there will absolutely be a mainstreaming of AI and ML. AI and ML have been have been things we have spoken about, things we have piloted for a very long time. Scale use of AI ML is something that organizations will need to go. The smarter ones will innovate faster. They will go on scale. They will invest on scale. 
I think gone are the days, uh, you know, people will be interested in doing pilots. I wish and hope India has been um, famously called as the graveyard of pilots. People have to learn from each other rather than recreate. And uh, there will be massive, uh, you know, scale use of AI ML building in as we emerge. And finally, the it's very important for traditional organizations. Uh, they do have incumbent IT and we have to be respectful of that situation. I believe there has to be a bold modernization of legacy uh, platforms in traditional companies. And I'm not saying you take it and throw it away, but modernization of your existing environment so you can support, uh, you know, for, uh, outward looking digitization. So we'll leave outward yeah, we'll leave you will leave, absolutely leapfrog. Absolutely leapfrog. So those are the five big things that I see happening as we emerge um, out of COVID and run. So, so Karan, just to build on what you said, and thank you for giving us those uh, five inputs. Is suppose a large organization, let's say BW five hundred, uh, let's say, you know, let's say an FMCG company like Levers or a Godrej, and you know, similar large companies. If they were spending X on their technology, what will that X become? Will it become 2X, 5X, or will it the X will get redistributed to new technologies? So my question is, does the technology spend go up? And you said it will become an OPEX, so it will provide an opportunity to increase it. Uh, second is, how does it get redistributed? You talked of throwing away legacy system, bringing in new modern yeah, I, I just want to be careful. I did not talk about throwing away legacy. I spoke about modernizing legacy. Okay. There is a path to modernizing legacy without throwing it away. Right. And then you can slowly do it. So I, I want to be very careful. Don't give a wrong, I don't want to give a wrong message on that. Now, you know, I will not try play crystal gaze on uh, will IT spend increase. I think what is more important is uh, the fact that technology adoption will increase is a given. That's very obvious. Technology is what's making us work today, what's allowing us to be uh, productive today. So the adoption of technology will increase. Now, the question is, if you go back to the old way of uh, buying technology, where you had to invest right up front before you could get the first benefit of technology, that's tough. Because then you are taking precious capital away from your core business. If I'm manufacturing, I got to pay my people. I got to get my raw material. I got to enhance my supply chain. Yeah, technology is super important for me, but I can't do anything without those three ingredients. So I have to use technology, and that is so clear to me, but I have to use it now in a way that I don't have an entry gate that's so high. And that's why consumption models. So if I look at the total cost, total, total cost is the wrong way to say it, but if I look at the total spend over a five-year period, sure, I think it will increase. As technology uh, footprint increases, sure, it will increase. But will that mean that you will suddenly have to spend the minute you come out of COVID and all IT companies going to stand up in front of you with a huge bill? I don't think that's going to be the way of consumption. The, the maturity of the SaaS-based model, the, uh, the cloud-based model has reached a point, Anurag, where people have tasted early success. It is famously sort of known now that uh, across all enterprises, mature enterprises, about 20% of uh, workloads, as we call it in the IT parlance, have moved to the cloud. So people know how to migrate. People know what to get out of it. They know the nuances. Uh, they know the security connotations as they come with the cloud. So people have tasted success. It's a question of scaling. People know the benefits of AI, ML, and small use cases, they got to scale it. So innovation on scale is going to be key for us. Uh, adoption model going from cap to CapEx to OpEx is going to allow us to do that without having to spend precious capital in, in terms of a high entry barrier. That's how I see traditional organizations, like as you said, a few names, have the ability. Equally so, Anurag, it's very important that organizations have the power to break. You cannot make the new without breaking the past. If you try hold a lot of the legacy of the past and try to go back, it'll be a lost opportunity in my view. If you go back to the old ways of delivering things, you know, one of the things I have been constantly saying in this period to every CEO is, as you get back to your offices, get to your conference rooms, put everything on the table. And if you find yourself doing something the same way that you were doing pre-COVID, question yourself three times before you go back. And you may still go back, but question yourself three times before you do that, because there is a new way of working. There's possibly a way of working. This opportunity should not be lost. This crisis should not be wasted. And uh, we should reinvent what we do, how we do, and, and you know how we execute in the marketplace. And yet I'm not, I'm not being insensitive to the fact that yes, there would still be some things that would not change. 
but the opportunity for ceos is massive to to reinvent themselves and just to you know i asked to so you not use the word tco total cost of ownership and it is about total implementation of technology call you know over a period of time as you said it becomes an with a saas based model it becomes an opex now where will suppose this 100 rupees was being spent in x by z where do you think will it get redistributed some of the things that you were a technology investor or a technology investor in the sense a user investing in it uh, was spending what are the new things that the user will spend on look you know i think it's it's fairly well recognized now um you know there's been many words given to data somebody is called data as water as data as oil etc so the power of data is is clearly established in people's mind most business models that have been disrupted whether it is in b2c environments whether it is in hospitality environments etc have been on the power of data that's clearly established so there's no question around that it's equally well known that a lot of incumbent organizations traditional organizations are sitting on precious data right so i think the shift you know what has happened in the past in urag and i you know again i want to be sensitive as respectful as I, as i can but there's a change happening so i have to be blunt uh, you know by the time when when a person decided to go out buy it a lot of the money was taken up by you know lots of hardware being thrown in and lots of software being thrown in by the time you wanted to do some business impacting you were like choked on money and you had spent all your money on it money was choked in look i think people that spend will shift to things like data that spend will shift to things like ai that spend will shift to things like analytics which are high business impact what changes the business for me and how can i minimally bring technology i want to bring more technology and burn less money today yes i may burn more over 5 years but i want to as burn less today as you see the impact and as you see the result as i see the impact the roi technology spent over a 3 year 5 year period will go up anurag there is no question about that it will go up it will go up significantly uh, i i won't sort of crystal gaze and say how much 2x to 3x sorry go ahead please you know when we talk of large corporations we understand what you know one of the huge things that happened is democratization of access to technology i think that has happened you know my maid is also equally prevalent and using technology as my my parents are using zoom or another video technology from google or whatever other players now do you see for the smes because it becomes an opex for smaller players uh, you know companies that have less than 30 crores of turnover 50 crores of turnover uh, as compared to companies that are 500 crore 1000 crores 2000 do you think technology will become more affordable and smaller players will be able to use technology better because they have no legacy plus their sure. businesses have become uh, so much driven by technology sure anurag i love this question because you used a term which i very which i use almost every day today which is at the core of uh, what technology companies should be doing which is democratize technology i think the core you know in the past technology has had a very elitist way of adoption you know you you know uh, think about it anurag the access to technology you had in your office uh, and i'm picking on you maybe it's not the same access that possibly the last person in your organization had there were tiers of usage but when we sit in this time everyone needs the same access everyone needs the same capabilities you need to talk to people collaborate with people share information and be productive so you almost need so the democratization of technology and i actually had promised myself i will not do a sell job on this uh, on this i'll not sort of wear my google hat on this on this table but i do have to because that's what google's always stood for democratizing technology putting technology out there making it easy to use and putting it in the hands of people i think that's so important i think one of the simplest things we did as we saw that people were uh, simply unable to work from home we took our our uh, you know our, our google meet platform and actually we said uh, with a clear mindset to serve customers and not to sell to them we said use it for free for the next 6 months we will not charge we'll see what happens after that but but go use it put capability and tools in the hands of the people and try to make sure there are not multiple tiers of course people will need a couple of new answers around technology depending on the the tier of usage but but don't build too many tiers so democratize the technology that is i think a very very well set point by you the second point is smes which have you know if you look at india and let's say to our country if you look at india what really is the india customer pyramid the india customer pyramid has some 5 600 customers at the top which are which are like any other customer in the world 
they are they are almost they they look they look like a customer in new york and you know i remember one of the people saying it in the past there is a new york on top of india and that new york behaves like new york but then the real india starts as you get down and that real india which is the mssm msmes in the country the number ranges up to 550 million as from many estimates uh, different nuances there are different tiers of them you know and i'm not going to sort of put them into one bucket but that's that's the 50 million msmes in this country that really can can use the power of technology to do many things simply first go out in front of customers they need they need digitization to get out in front get their business online they need productivity they need sales force automation they need an accounting system they need technology how an integration they, of all of this oh that's the complex part on rag that's where the fun begins because they had to now if i'm a if i'm a, a msme with 100 people i don't i can't afford an it manager i can't afford a cio's function right i had to go buy hardware i had to look at a mom and pop shop to buy hardware i had to go figure out you know a software half the time i'd be scurrying around to see you know what can i we can i find software then i had to go back borrow steel and get a integrator to put it together for me and then i had to pay ongoing support charges i had to worry about security i had to worry about upgrades it was a unending problem so i said let me not use it for now let me use minimal suddenly with these models of consumption as i said the saas models the cloud models they allow you to use technology why is there an explosion anurag for uh, for saas companies in india you suddenly see we always said india is is a house of services arbitrage look no there is massive capability building in um, in, in 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 the indian ecosystem around saas companies because these consumption models have now matured out look at organizations like zoho look at organizations like tally they have provided the right ecosystem for for customers we are making we are working with the um, with a lot of players in the market we recently announced a collaboration with uh, with with airtel where we said we will use the airtel route to market to go out to msmes uh, msmes and provide them technology in a consumption model so i think a lot has changed uh, and a lot will change post covid uh, just because of the maturity of all these technology models uh, anurag thank you uh, karan i want to ask you two more real questions uh you know earlier you would deal with the cio traditionally 20 years back then it became a cto then in the last 5 years it was a cdo a chief not every company had a chief digital officer and i would say the ceo needs to be the cdo right and you said that at right right up front that today for the first time the ceos are interested in understanding technology absorption in their company now is the cmo also got when you talk of customers as the cmo also got into the mix so are you dealing with four or five people or the function of a cto cio cdo cmo getting funneled into one um and you know technology companies have understood that so much money is being spent on marketing on customer acquisition so technology sure. needs to be provided for that so you know marketing technology mark tech uh, has become very important so give us your insights sure. into this Look, you know, this is a trick question, and I'm I'm trying I'll try not to fall for your question because um, you know uh, I I do have my views on this, but I think um, um, I would say these roles have very distinct personas, um, and you took the CEO out of the mix because there are many CEOs who want to be digital officers as well. There is there is the CEO, there is a digital officer, there is a technology officer, the IOC IT officer. there is the chief marketing officer these personas have different roles in my view uh, if i just simply take um, uh, the cdo and the cio i i i think there are distinct roles for them that is why they have you know and there are pros and cons of models where uh, how these are constructed but i think they have different personas the cdo sits very deep in the business and looks at technology that changes business the, the it officer the it uh, information officer Uh, runs the mechanics of the whole IT shop. I think those roles have very distinct personas. Some organizations have tried to kind of bring them together. I think those those models exist on Rag. It's it's depending on the industry you are in, the maturity level that you are in, uh, you will do these uh, these different models. So I, I necessarily am not uh, you know in favor of one or the other. It's it's what works for that organization. What works for that organization really? But the the core But point what's is your viewpoint, Karan Bajwa. Ideally, how should it be? you know again it's i don't want to put my viewpoint out there because there are pros and cons and it's not proven as yet it depends on the industry you are in if you are in a very mature business you absolutely will need roles that are very distinct if you are in a not so mature business possibly not 
So I think it's it's not a one size fits all Anurag. But the more important point is Anurag, when you have these roles, how does the CEO empower the role? The CDO has to be massively empowered in terms of the decisions that he, he or she can influence on business. The IT officer or the technology offer has to be massively empowered. I think empowerment is key in my view. There is more work that needs to be done in empowering these roles uh, than possibly the nuances around merging or not merging these roles in my view. I think that's very, very critical. A lot of CEOs and boards, when this whole technology disruption hit them, I think they kind of the ones that kind of wanted to do something, put a CDO in place. But what they did not do very well is they did not empower that CDO in the organization. They did not empower it, that individual. So I think that's the that's the relook that you should do, especially as you reinvent business. Because when you reinvent your business post this crisis, you are not going to reinvent your business uh, from a technology or an infrastructure standpoint. You, you are looking at your customer. You're looking at your partners. You're looking at your supply chain ecosystem. That's those are the stakeholders that will determine what disruption has to be done. So the digital officer has to look at each of those stakeholders and, and, and value equations and then kind of think about what digitization techniques. So it's technology later, it's business first, right? That kind of so that empowerment has to be very, very important. And then you spoke about uh, uh, about the CMO and look, you know, the CMO, uh, you know, from, from our vantage point view, Google works very deeply with the CMO community in, um, in, in enabling them. You know, extend their outreach into the market and drive impact. And uh, again, I think uh, the marketing technology, as as the word you used, is is really providing a base for solving different marketing challenges with the emerging technologies that that we have available today. Um, it's just simply, you know, a few examples it enables you to create very powerful marketing tools and solutions with uh, with less time being spent on maintenance and management. You know, the cloud option, for example, offers you a very flexible framework to build whatever is required at a pace that matches the industry requirement versus, you know, think about if you had to roll out a new, uh, new, um, new offering, a new solution, a new product, the amount it would take you in five years ago to the time it takes you now, it's unimaginable. And that's being powered through the use of technology. There are capabilities that you can bring in. I don't want to go deep in technology, but things that you can do from a cloud standpoint would help you reduce the amount of time it takes you to innovate and launch these capabilities faster uh, and, and sort of it goes on. So I think marketeers have used technology and there is much more that they can do in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, leveraging technology. And that is where Anurag, you are seeing the, the convergence of media and technology. You've seen some of them happen in the industry. There'll be more happening. Media companies will be very much pushed by the customers to have a very strong technology edge on why should I make this investment? Give me more information on what will it do for me? Give me more data points on why should I consume more, more media assets? So I think media and technology in that sense will merge and that will be pushed by the customers. Thank you, Karan. And, uh, you know, I'm enjoying this conversation because it's making me think as a, someone who is an entrepreneur and who, uh, who did start a technology business 20 years back, but somewhere became a media business. Uh, coming back to government has been a huge user of technology. Uh, do you think going forward will government, whether central governments, ministries, and how they interface with citizens, whether it's for a passport, whether it's for a, you know, a license, whether it's for a, you know, registering a land record, do you think sure. both at the state level and central level investments in technology grow up and uh, if they go up, will governments be literally be on a cloud? Uh, sure. Do you think no. uh, the government should be on a cloud? And give us some examples how usage of technology uh, in the last few years helped the citizen interface and governance being better. Sure. Look, I, I can't again predict whether it will happen or not, but I think it should happen. The government now has a responsibility to rekindle the ecosystem in India. We've seen the $200 billion services industry, IT services industry get created in India. We've seen that, right? Uh, that industry is facing a, a challenge in terms of reinvention. The value equations are changing, right? A lot have a lot sort of has already changed, but uh, that disruption continues. This crisis is a massive opportunity for the government to create a, a very different ecosystem. The government should invest very deeply in capabilities like AI, like ML, like cloud, like security, because these are the capabilities that the ecosystem needs. Look, you know, Anurag, when you and I as organizations invest, we are, our, our ability is small, but governments have very huge appetite. 
if government invests very deeply in these technologies, you almost create a massive ecosystem of skills and capabilities and people that can then be used to transform the industry. So honestly, how much does the government need to invest? It, it's not much from a governmental spend standpoint. A few billion dollars can totally transform uh, both governance as well as government's ability to create an ecosystem. So I think government, and I'm sure uh, this is a very, very smart uh, you know, set of people who will absolutely look at this. So I'm sure government has the ability to put massive investments in these cutting edge areas. And it's not about going buying more hardware or cloud. That's not the idea. The idea is to build capabilities on massive, massive scale. My only call to government would be that now on, as you emerge these cutting edge technologies, which have to mature out, you have to leverage the model of partnership versus procurement. The model of consumption has to be you partner with you and you choose your partner. You can choose multiple partners, but go out partner versus having to pick and choose and, and, and procure in the old way. So use the, use the model of partnership versus procurement is, is my only sort of call to the government. But the government has a massive opportunity to rekindle uh, not just the technology landscape in the country, but also help reinvent the technology landscape in the country. And, and that's what I believe uh, is the opportunity for the government. Thank you, Karan. At this point, I want to bring in some people who are asking questions and I possibly will bring one or two on the video. But let me ask sure. a question about Prachi Chandiramani is asking three questions, but I'll, uh, I'll take one of them. How is Google Cloud partnering effectively with various startups uh, post COVID-19? So is Google Cloud partnering with startups? What are you doing in the startup ecosystem? Sure. I think Google's always worked with the startup ecosystem. The broader Google platform, it, cut, it sort of goes way beyond the cloud platform. The broader Google platform is a very strong outreach into the whole developer ecosystem as well as the startup ecosystem. We've been supporting, fostering many ways. Outreach is, uh, uh, is, is very, <clears throat> very uh, expansive, if you will. I think there are many ways that we engage. Uh, right from providing technology to providing capability to providing the early support to a startup, scale support to a startup. Uh, there are many ways uh, that we that we engage and that, you know, obviously right now these startups are going through their own <clears throat> learning curve as they as they get challenged on this crisis and uh, there is more push around. Uh, they were on a growth path. Now they're going to be, you know, held accountable for different metrics as they emerge out of this crisis. So we are deeply engaged with the startup ecosystem, the developer ecosystem, and we will continue, and the whole uh, investor ecosystem, and we'll continue building on those investments. Okay, there's one more question uh, from Pratik Chatterjee. He's the head of Copcom at NIT. He's the head of marketing also. He's also the CMO. Mr. Bajwa, you've talked about democratization of technology. How do you ensure security while doing so? You did mention security twice, size, but can you give us some examples? And Pratik, I'd love to have an offline conversation. Um, you know, we, I, I've respected your organization and, uh, and, and the people who founded it. Um, look, I think security is not an afterthought, Pratik. It's embedded in the core of your products. It's embedded in the algorithm of when you are building, when you are developing your product capability. And that's how, you know, a lot of tech companies, including ourselves, have been looking at it. Uh, you know, if you think about... Uh, and again, you know, I, I sort of, sorry, gravitate back to wearing my Google hat. If you look at the scale services that Google provides, we almost provide uh, about nine services that have a billion users each. Uh, and incidentally, all of them run on the cloud, cloud platform. Uh, the scale of these services, security is embedded on these on these platforms. So I think it's it's a fundamentally different way of, uh, of addressing security uh, in that sense, uh, Pratik. Okay. Um, you know... Um, Karan, uh, Paran, Prana Mita Mukherjee is asking, Bengali names can be tongue twisted. You know, they're beautifully, they're beautiful names in really, really, uh, uh, you know, they have very good meanings too. So Prana Mita is ask, Mukherjee is asking, post COVID-19, what changes will come in the marketing strategy of Google Cloud? You know, I, it's uh, look. We are we are learning through this transition. I would not hazard, um, and I'm not the right person, honestly, on uh, to be commenting on this one. Uh, my mandate kind of uh, does not extend to the marketing capability. So, uh, and then we are learning through the process. So, I would uh, I would not be able to give a very 
good answer to this question. So I would I would kind of respectfully pass. If there is a follow through that needs to be done, I'd love to Anurag. I can offline get it followed yes, through sure. with my colleagues on the other side. So I'll take one more question before before I bring my final set of questions. Uh, you know, now I'll it's a real question and we'll take it. Mr. Badwa, it's very kind of you to agree to a Google to a video interaction. We are doing it on Zoom. Um, why we, uh, Mr. Gogia, Nikesh Gogia, though he spells it as Nikesh, N-I-K-E-S-J. Why is this meeting not on Google Meet rather than Zoom? We should have thought about it. And you've been kind enough. And you know, I think you're being for being broad-minded. I mean, we use Google oh, I, Meet for I, some I, of our uh, webinars. And Anurag, it would have been so easy for me to to reach out to you and say that I only will do this meeting if I if you were to do it on my platform. And I think that kind of defeats the purpose. We we position our platforms on the value of the platform. There are users that use all platforms. We have to be respectful of the fact that there are all kinds of users using all technologies. Uh, I you know so I I don't think it's a question of forcing anyone to use something just because I am there. I use Meet. I use Meet for all my my own meetings. So. Yeah, so I, I don't, so I, you know, thank you to Gage for asking that question. So, case, on, on behalf of Business World Exchange for me, we used it. I recently did a conversation with the CEO of a large, uh, you know, staffing company and he uses Google Meet. So we did a Google, you know, we did a Google uh, uh, conversation. So I think it ne it didn't strike to our mind. And for some reason, Zoom's adoption has grown. It's easy and we are familiar. There are many technologies. Google is was fantastic and next time we'll be sensitive when we're talking to a technology leader we use his or her technology and again don't don't mistake me anurag it's fine i think the point is the fact that I, we speak about democratization of technology people have to be able to use access technology each one of us wearing a hat will be able to position our capabilities based on value so it's not about forcing anyone to use any particular technology in my view so pritam joshi is asking um, is there any plans from Google to launch an updated version of whatever uh, they're offering? I mean, that's the way I understand the question. I did not get the question if... Um, so he's, he's if asking, he's even I didn't get it fully. Pritam Joshi is asking, is there any Google planning to update uh, whatever you, your offerings are? I think Google is ahead. Of course, it's it's an ongoing, uh, it's, a, it's an ever ongoing, there's always enhancements to the product, there is updates to the capabilities, it's an ongoing exercise, and I don't think it's going to get impacted by this, it's an ongoing exercise. Uh, I'm sorry if there was a deeper meaning to that question, I couldn't catch it, but but I guess uh, there will always be updates and upgrades to, to products and capabilities. Uh, Karan, I want to ask you my last two questions before I wrap up, sure. and I'll ask one personal question, so three. First is, you became a CEO at a very young age. You became a CEO almost 20 years back, right? Uh, you were, you know. Now, what are the skills required to lead in this COVID? So what are the new skills people can add in the post-COVID? What are the skills that will matter over the next 12 to 36 months that one needs to add on, both as a professional in middle management and as a leader in senior management? You know, I've spoken to so many people uh, on this subject that I have to be consistent and I won't give you an answer that I have that is different from what I've given people. I've been a huge believer of um, of soft skills and I've, I've always believed that hard skills are easy to get. Soft skills are tougher to get. Um, and uh, I've been a huge believer and I feel that as you cross a certain stage in your career, when you take on senior leadership role, it's actually soft skills that differentiate you one rug. And there are three capabilities I've always held very close to my heart in terms of learning as well as uh, coaching people. One's conflict resolution. A lot of people do not take conflicts. They put them under the rug. It only grows. Conflict resolution is number one. Uh, number two, it's resilience. Leaders have to demonstrate resilience. And this is a capability that's holding us. I go to smile every single day, Anurag. I cannot walk into my office with my head down because I'm impacting hundreds of people. So I've got to be always smiling and yet I may have my moods and, and my issues, but uh, resilience and demonstrated resilience of, an, of a leader is extremely important. The third thing is handling ambiguity. The world is not uh, zeros and ones. The world is not blacks and whites. The, the shades of gray that, are, that, are the, that people have to be able to handle, I'm not talking about in, in a negative way, but, but people have to be able to handle ambiguity. So handling ambiguity, resilience and conflict resolution in my view are three very strong capabilities that differentiate leaders 
I think, I, Karan, you know, I want to say to many of the people who tune in and interact with promoters, CEOs, whole day, some of them are my friends, some are acquaintances, some are just business relationships. But I'll tell you, Mr. Bajwa always replies to a mate. He works for large organizations, so he has to involve other people. In what, but he always acknowledges a male and it is very specific. You know, that's a simple quality. Not everyone has that. You know, and I, I admire him for that because it, it, he's a, you know, he lives what he's saying. So he talked about how you resolve conflict, how you deal with ambiguity and resilience. I think if you just had these three, everything else can be added on. You know, they are, those are more, uh, you know, tools, I wouldn't call them skills. You can use these tools. Your technology is a tool, it's not a skill. I think what Karan talked about is soft skills are the real skills. And he's very business like because he works for a large organization. If he needs to take a decision, Mr. Bajwa will bring in is the specialist or whoever is the head of the department. And you know, in large organizations, there is also a matrix reporting. You know, so I, I admire him for always being responsive and specific. Uh, specific. Uh, my second question is. You know, we are talking about technology. Now, security is a big issue. Pratik Chaudhary asked you that question, right? Uh, as the usage of technology goes up, uh, there will be challenges like we are spending more screen time. Today, education has become edutech. You know, there's a hybrid model. It's e-education. So there are negative impacts of technology. One is the increased screen time. Second is especially in children. And young millennials who are working, um, you know, we've learned things through physical, you know, face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, so they are not having the art of conversation, which is the soft skills that you talked about. And third is what we talked about, digital democratization, but there is a digital divide that is being created. So how do you as a technology leader uh, respond to these negative impacts, increase on screen time, no personal interactions like they used to be. And third is access and, you know, access devices and bandwidth not being available to everyone as a digital divide being created. So what are companies like Google Cloud doing to make sure that such a impact is mitigated? Anurag, um, look, uh, we are in a very extraordinary time. So our behaviors, are, are kind of extreme. So, and I would not extrapolate these behaviors uh, beyond the time that we are in this zone. Screen time has gone up because that's the only mode we and you and I can talk to each other. That's the only way we can talk to each other. Will it remain the same? I don't think so. I, I think it will change. How much time you spend on the screen, whether do you have personal time, which was the second part of your question, all points back to how do you maintain a work-life balance? That's a very, very personal. Again, that's been a core belief for me that work-life balance is a very core belief. People have asked me many times, how do you maintain a work-life balance? And I, I, my answer has been, <clears throat> first of all, I'm the wrong benchmark. I enjoy my work. You know, I have a problem with work and life balance being, uh, work and life being, being uh, uh, talked in different ways. It almost feels like, you know, work is something which is very drugged and then, you know, life is the fun part where, you know, I enjoy my work. I enjoy my work every single day, and uh, and I and I uh, I never think of it as a burden. So I I have never had this problem of work and life balance, and yet I find time to do things that I have to do. You know, what have I done in this um, uh, in this in this uh, COVID time? I started walking. You know, I I started uh, with with the aim that I want to achieve uh, ten thousand steps a day. Gosh, I did that, and I upped the ante fifteen thousand steps. And then I up the ante to 20,000 steps. I've not been able to do it every day, but I have touched 20,000 steps. And one of these days, I was actually walking, walking 20,000 steps in my balcony. So I think it's a question of pushing yourself and finding the time. By the way, I had a long time aspiration to learn golf. I'm learning golf now. Uh, there are many other things I'm doing with my family. I'm, I've started to learn cooking. And yet I'm working 15 to 16 hours a day. And I'm loving each bit of that, that moment. So I think it's a very personal thing, screen time. You know, if I was not on the screen, I'd be in office. So it's a very personal thing, Anurag, that each one of us have to find our zones of comfort and work through that. And on your point on the digital divide, I think the digital divide, Anurag, is only reducing. Look at just the connectivity in our country. Look at the bandwidth in our country. Look at the data use in our country. Look at the smartphone usage in the country. Every aspect points to the fact that the, the digital divide is decreasing 
and uh, it's just been pushed uh, more by the fact that people now can't engage physically hence they're using digital capabilities whether it is a form of voice or video or data so i think the digital divide is narrowing uh, anurag and uh, and yes we are as a country are very diverse we have to always be mindful of of taking the mass along and yet we will always keep pushing uh, you know the 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 edges on this one but i guess in our country we are in the right direction in terms of bridging the divide and and i and i and i hope we continue on that journey uh, as sir i'll ask you a personal question and you answered it a little bit in my last question that you know you i agree with you if you love your work uh, you know if you love what you do then you know it's not work and if it's not work you continue to do it so it's about making an impact making a contribution if you're doing that i'm sure uh, you know work feels like a blessing confucius said if you make your hobby your profession you don't have to work i think karan bagwa uh, is talking about the same thing and because i've known him for 22 23 years a common friend introduced and uh, so i know he walks the talk if he's not saying it he's always on always working but finds time for other uh, you know relationships in life whether it's family or the relationship with himself my last question to you karan is if we talk to karan bajwa 12 to 16 months from now uh where would you be what would you have achieved for yourself for your family for your customers for your country in the next 12 to 18 months what is the impact uh, karan bajwa would like to have on the ecosystem that he interacts with you know it's not important what i achieve honestly it's not it's not uh, it's not kind of you know uh, for me the mandate that i have now is a mandate to create a platform i i get uh, hugely inspired every day by the opportunity to create an organization uh, practically from ground zero i i get inspiration from working for a fabulous culture and building on that culture um, I, i believe the technology innovation that is available in our hands today is unprecedented the scale of that technology innovation is unprecedented um, you know my 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 own aspiration is to create a platform that is able to solve complex customer problems on scale in this country and and drive technology adoption way deeper it's a, it's a long standing dream of mine to solve the technology adoption for the mid market of this country and that's an aspiration i'm yearning for in the next 18 months and rock and on a personal level you also talk for learning golf about being able to walk i can clearly learn the walking bit from you and I'm, i'm doing 3000 steps is not good enough i think <laughs> i'll try to 5000 today and you know up it up a little bit little bit but i we since we have another 7 minutes to while ask you some supplementary question uh, where do you see the indian economy 6 months to 12 months from now and in the near immediate future i know it may not pick up like it was but where do you see it 6 to 12 months do you see demand coming back uh, because you know that is very important to lift the sentiment sure look at rag it's it's extremely difficult you know you ask this question to anyone and i will go back to foundational beliefs uh, i'll go to foundational beliefs of um, what was happening in this country prior to covid and then we will have to kind of erase the impact of covid from our lives as we as we go past covid and then see has the curve changed i don't think the curve will change will the curve take a dip absolutely yes we already seen that dip but the fundamentals of the economy the consumption of the economy the growth of the economy those fundamentals will not change yes it will take us some time i cannot say it will 6 or 12 months i cannot predict that but um, if we were to uh, take a larger sample size of time and looking and be looking back 5 years hence forth and say has the has the curve fundamentally changed i think the the strength of the economy and the strength of the consumption economy in our country will still get us past it and yet we will have to go through a tough time before the better time comes in thank you mr bajwa for talking to us it's been wonderful talking to you and i will look forward to more interactions with you i want to tell our viewers our next issue of business world the is you know the current issue that is it the stand is on the geo effect uh, you know how Mr Mukesh Ambani is unlocking you for our next issue of BW Business World and the whole thing next week on Business World is is technology transform triumph it's the T3 how technology will help us get a better hold of our lives of our business operation 
and hopefully contribute to the nation's GDP. So uh, to all the exchange from India viewers, uh, Mr. Bajwa talked about how marketing has started to use technology more, but there is a need to adopt uh, more technology. And he talked about how CMOs are a core, uh, you know, partners for him, for uh, his offerings and for technology companies and how they can do better. Uh, I, I was tempted to ask him that, will the chief data officer be the chief technology officer? Uh, not many organizations have the chief, chief data officer now. Uh, they don't have a data head. And again, the data head doesn't sit in the board meetings because data determines how consumers are responding to a product offering or a service offering, to what price points, what is the consumer behavior, you know, what is working in terms of adoption. So I think my takeaways from Mr. Bajwa's talk are on two levels. One on technology, it will move from a CapEx model to an OpEx model. SaaS will become mainstream. He talked about how he has a dream of the middle India, the SMEs adopting technology even more and making the SMEs more competitive using technology, using Google yeah. Cloud and other technologies. Third, he also talked about the fact that uh, you know technology adoption will create technology democratization and we'll deal with the issues of digital divide as we go along. Some of those can get solved automatically. He also talked about the fact that the CIO has his or her own role, the CDO has his or her own role, and they're working together to make sure that the business objectives are met. Last but not the least, he talked about the fact that the three key skills needed are personal skills, soft skills, uh, and they are resilience, the ability to deal with conflict and to resolve conflict, and last but not the least, uh, to be able to deal with ambiguity. We, we, because we live in times where we don't have visibility beyond a week, beyond a month, and we live day by day. On this uh, happy note and a knowledgeable note, thank you, Mr. Badwa, for uh, engaging with us and talking to us. I'm sure our viewers would be more wise and they will use technology in a way that enhances their life. Thank you, and we wish you luck in your mission to empower everyone in terms of technology. Thank you. Thank you. God thank bless you. you. Thank you.